The title of this lecture is uh, Austrian Theory of the Business Cycle, but as I think you'll see, it's actually a, a part of a much broader uh, aspect of Austrian economics, uh, something I call capital-based macroeconomics. And uh, the business cycle theory is just something of a corollary to the more general uh, ma uh, capital-based macroeconomics. I think you'll see how that works. Uh, so what we're going to do is, is sketch out the whole business of this sustainable and unsustainable growth. And uh, I don't mind giving the punchline away. It depends on what the central bank is doing and what they're doing with interest rates and that sort of thing. If interest rates are market determined, it turns out we get uh, sustainable growth. Uh, if they're manipulated by the central bank, you get something else. And it comes in the form of the Austrian business cycle. To put this in perspective, I'll just list the elements of capital-based macroeconomics, and you'll see that most of the elements are things that you already know. Uh, production possibilities frontier, you've seen that uh, in standard textbooks and even in my earlier lectures. Loanable funds market, very broadly conceived uh, market for funds. It's a, the markets, plural, that channel savings into the business community for investment purposes. Uh, the structure of production, we got to work out of that yesterday, so we'll be able to almost skip across that because you've already seen it. And then labor markets, well, of course, that's, uh, that's treated heavily in Keynesian economics and monetarist economics and so on. The only difference here is that we have stage specific labor markets. They don't all go up and down at once. Uh, depends on what stage of production we're talking about. And uh, our applications here are sustainable growth as supported by saving on the one hand and unsustainable growth triggered by credit expansion. Now, what you'll see is I'll take up the bulk of the time with the first part, the sustainable growth. Uh, and it, this comes from a a methodological point uh, that I got from Hayek. This is a paraphrasing. But he says, before we could even ask how things might go wrong, we must first explain how they could ever go right. Okay? And so that first part, explaining how they can go right, is the bigger job. And once we get through that, then it becomes obvious what happens uh, when things go wrong, when the Federal Reserve is... Uh, manipulating the interest rate. Uh, that's a methodological point, by the way, that virtually all other schools ignore. Keynes, for instance, assumed that the market was un unstable and it doesn't go right, period. So let's start out with the production possibilities frontier. Uh, and to, with a macroeconomic uh, application, we're looking at the trade-off between consumption and investment. So under favorable conditions, a fully employed economy is what we're talking about, features consumption and investment as alternative uses of the economy's resources. So it allocates resources in both uses, making the most of the trade-off. And of course, that's the market at work for you and for me. So we may be at that point uh, on the frontier and by the way, the frontier is, is the locus of sustainable combinations of consumption and investment. We'll see later that it's possible to go beyond the frontier, but not sustainably. In other words, you, you get into a region with, that's unsustainable, namely a boom that will end in a bust. Okay, the PPF... Here I've just indicated that it's used for a lot of things. Everybody's seen it in the textbook, no matter which one they use. And it's used for emphasizing the concept of scarcity, illustrating the implied trade-off, and exp uh, expositing theories of capital and interest, economic growth, international trade. But it rarely appears in a macroeconomic construction. Uh, 
certainly not in Keynesian economics, not in uh, monetarism, because the monetarists simply add C plus I and call it output. Uh, but in the Austrian theory, uh, it, it's, it's critical. So investment here represents gross investment, which is typical of the way uh, this uh, diagram is used. So it includes replacement capital, uh, what Frank Knight called maintenance uh, in my lecture yesterday. And so we have that whole, uh, that whole distance of, of the uh, horizontal axis is gross investment. A good part of that in a developed economy is replacement capital, but some of it is new investment. Okay, net investment, investment over and above what it takes to replace. <coughs> so with positive net investment, the economy grows. You get more capital, you produce more stuff, produce more investment goods, more consumption goods. You get more stuff. The PPF shifts outward from year to year, permitting increasing levels of both consumption and investment. We can show that here. Uh, <coughs> watch the economy grow. You can hear the economy grow, okay? <coughs> it grows. Okay, so four periods of growth are shown with consumption as well as in saving and investment increasing in each period. The actual rate of expansion of the PPF depends on many factors. We won't rehearse them here. It would take too long. Uh, but importantly, a change in saving preferences. See, what I've done so far, I haven't changed anything. Although people are saving, they've been saving, they keep saving but a change in saving preferences, which provokes movement along the initial PPF, affects the rate at which the PPF expands outward. So suppose people become more thrifty, more future-oriented. They reduce their current consumption and save instead. So watch the movement along the PPF. And this is just ordinary market mechanisms making that work, as we'll see, it moves along. Uh, and so already, we've departed from any kind of a Keynesian notion because in Keynes, consumption and investment always move in the same direction. We couldn't possibly move along the PPF, which slopes downward, okay? With the increased saving and investment, the economy grows at a faster rate. So let's watch that. grows at bigger intervals. <coughs> All right. It's the increase in saving that makes the difference. We can compare the high income growth economy with the original low income growth economy, put them both together and show with no initial increase in saving, the economy grows at a modest rate. Look on the left panel. You see it growing at a modest rate. With the initial increase in saving, investment increases at the expense of consumption, after which both consumption and investment increase dramatically from period to period. So watch that. First decrease, then increase. And then you draw a line across there where you can see that after four periods, people are consuming more than they did before. And that's the whole business of saving, okay? You save now in order to be able to purchase more in the future. Uh, and while you're saving, of course, you're getting uh, accrued interest, uh, not in this country, we're down to about half a percent. Uh, but uh, that's, that's the way it works. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not your father trying to admonish you to save, okay? I'm just showing what the consequences are uh, of saving, that you are able to consume more in the future than you otherwise would have. Okay. But you probably should save more. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Okay, the market for loanable funds. That's the interest rate plotted against saving and investment. We have a supply of it and a demand for it. So saving constitutes the supply of loanable funds. Upward sloping, as you would expect, demand reflects the business community's willingness to borrow and undertake investment projects. And that's the demand for loanable funds. And of course, the market mechanism here will then settle on that intersection. So a straight application, straightforward application of Marshallian supply and demand analysis. And then you can see that vertical or that horizontal distance is the investable resources. In other words, those are funds that are handed over to the investment community with which they can uh, buy equipment and materials and so on for beefing up the economy. And the savings that comes out of income, the income uh, was earned by people working and making stuff. And if they didn't consume that much, that meant they left some stuff over, okay? And, and that's equivalent to their saving. And it, it lets the business community take possession of that stuff that was left over and increase the productive capacity of the economy. That's the market at work for you and for me. So here it just points out loanable funds was closely identified with David Robinson. Yeah, there he is. Uh, that was before Keynes. And then on the suggestion of Roy Herod, Roy Herod couldn't believe that Keynes was taking loanable funds theory out of, out of his macro theory. And, and Herod read the draft of the general theory. And so he advised Keynes that if, he, if for sure he was taking that theory out, he should make that clear to the readers. And so Keynes put that diagram in to emphasize that he was throwing it out, <laughs> okay? If you thumb through the general theory, you'll see that diagram is the one and only diagram in the whole general theory. There are no diagrams in the general theory, except this one, uh, kind of a screwy version, as you'll see later of that one. Uh, but, uh, and it's on page 180, I won't make you look for it. Market for loanable funds. So if people become more future oriented, they increase their saving, causing the interest rate to fall and thereby encouraging business community to undertake more investment projects, all right? So watch the savings curve shift right. There it goes, okay? Lower interest rate, which inspires investors to undertake uh, more investment. With a given technology, saving and investment are prerequisite to genuine, sustainable economic growth. Now, I put up two diagrams here, and uh, it turns out we can use them together. Loanable funds market shows how interest rates bring saving and investment into line with one another. The PPF shows the trade-off is struck between consumption and investment. So market adjustments in output prices, wages, and other input prices keep the economy functioning on its PPF. That's under normal conditions, normal, normal market conditions. Okay, these two capital-based macroeconomics show these two elements, uh, show the pattern of movements con of consumption, saving, and investment, and the interest rate that are consistent with the change in intertemporal preferences. And now you have to watch these both at once. They sort of move in tandem with one another. Um, before people become more future, as before people become more future oriented, they save more, which transmits a signal of lower interest rates to the business community. So watch that process. Here it goes. Okay, so it, it's the lowering of the rate of interest that uh, causes that point on the frontier to move along it in that direction. Okay, the lower the 
the lower rate of interest establishes a new equilibrium in the loanable funds market and the economy moves along the PPF in the direction of more investment and less current consumption. It'll be more future consumption because they're undertaking investment and that investment will materialize in the future. Businessmen know, business people know, that when people save, they save up for something, okay? They don't save for fun. You know, saving isn't fun, <laughs> okay? <laughs> they save up for something. And how in the world do business people figure out what that something is? Well, that, that job is the entrepreneurial job, okay? Now, if you don't have any entrepreneurs, then your market's in trouble. <laughs> but fortunately, in this country at least, we do have entrepreneurs. Even the possibility of a market economy could work this way is at odds with Keynesian theory because it, it shows consumption and investment moving in opposite directions. That never happens in Keynes. That's what that says. Okay. So according to Keynes, any reduction in consumer spending will result in excess inventories, which in turn would cause production cutbacks, worker layoffs, spiraling downwards of the economy and, and expenditures. The economy would go into recession. The business community would commit itself to less, not more investment. And otherwise, he's saying it would fall inside the PPF. All right. Well, in his theory, it would, because he's thrown out the market mechanisms that would keep it from doing that. Uh, Keynes called that the paradox of thrift. Don't, don't save. You wish you hadn't. Now, if retail inventories were representative investment, then Keynes would be right. Here, the derived demand effect dominates. Reduced consumer spending means reduced inventory replacement. Well, duh, yeah. Uh, in general, late-stage investments move with consumer spending. But here's the other part of the story that Keynes leaves out. However, the interest rate effect dominates in the long term or early-stage investments. A lower interest rate can stimulate industrial construction, for instance, or product development. The longer the production process takes place, then the more critical the interest cost is of those, of those projects, even if it's multi-structured. All along the way, all the, the interest rate costs are pretty heavy if the interest rate is high. If the interest rate falls, then that, that dramatically lowers the cost of engaging in long-term investment. To keep track of changes in the general pattern of investment, we need to consider the structure of production and the stage-specific labor markets. So we can do that, and here I can zip forward because you've seen this yesterday. So we've got a tame Hayekian triangle here with time on the horizontal axis and final output on the vertical axis and the sequence of stages that lead from the early stages to uh, ultimate consumption. And we've got our friendly long-term investor, a researcher, and our retail manager, which is late stage. So late stage investment activities are simplified by inventory management. Yeah, that's right. For pedagogical convention, convenience, the initial capital structure is shown as having five stages. That's arbitrary. How many stages does the economy actually have? You can't answer that any more than you can answer how many good, how many different goods are produced in the economy. Huh? No one has an answer to that question either, but there are stages of production. It does take time and so on. But pedagogically, we represent it as five stages. <laughs> With growth, though, the number will increase. That's, uh, that's a developed economy. The more developed the economy is, typically the more stages of production you have. So although five of these stages are in operation during any time period, okay, we could take a field trip and see things going on at each and every stage of production. But if we step back and look at the whole process, we see 
goods moving from stage to stage to stage to stage. It's just two different interpretations, two different perspectives on the structure of production. So watch the resources or goods in process move through the stages. We've seen this too, but we won't bother with it. We won't bother with the Model A Fords and so on. Together, the sequence of stages form a Hayekian triangle, a summary description of the economy's intertemporal structure of production. That's right. In a growing economy, see, I've, I've eliminated the stages. They're still there. I'm just not showing pictures of them. In a growing economy, the triangle increases in size along with the outward expansion of the production possibilities frontier. Now, this is with, with a given rate of saving, not a changing rate, a given rate of changing, when the PPF is expanding, well, so does this, so does this triangle. So watch that process. Like so. When people choose to save more, they send two seemingly conflicting, with emphasis on seemingly, signals to the market. And uh, Keynes would be baffled by this seemingly conflicting signals. Decrease in consumption, decreased consumption dampens the demand for investment goods that are close to the temporal proximity with consumable output. This is the derived demand effect. Reduced interest rates, which means lower borrowing costs, stimulates demand for investment goods that are temporarily remote, temporarily remote from the consumable output. This is the time discount or interest rate effect. Okay. So derived demand and time discount are in conflict only if investment is conceived of the simple aggregate, such as Keynes, C plus I plus G. So I, Keynes consider, well, here's I. Does it go up or does it go down? He, there's no in-between on that one. But in capital-based macroeconomics, capital and hence investment is conceived as a structure. Changes in the demand for investment then can add differentially to and or subtract differentially from the several stages of production that make up the structure. And here it just says, well, this is, this is a significant. Keynes theorizing in terms of aggregates rather than in terms of structures underlies Hayek's claim, quoted here, Mr. Keynes' aggregates conceal the most fundamental mechanisms of change. Okay, so increased saving results in a reallocation of resources among the stages of production. The two effects, drive demand and time discount, have their separate and complementary effects on the capital structure. The drive demand effect here, decreased demand for consumption goods, dampens the investment activities in the late stages of production. Time discount, it stimulates investment in the more remote stages of production. So watch the structure of production respond to an increase in saving. There it goes, okay? You even get a sixth stage, okay? And may get a seventh and eighth with further saving. And now you notice consumption is down, but that's only an initial result because as the economy develops, it will grow at a faster rate because of that increased saving and consumption will be up within four or five uh, periods as shown in earlier graph, okay? Increased saving then has the effect of both the magnitude of the investment aggregate and the temporal pattern of the capital creation. So look at it, watch the economy respond to an increase in saving. It's all coordinated here. Looks like that. The PPF shows that more saving permits more investment. There's a little arrow. Hayekian triangle shows that capital creation in the late stages, such as retail, 
inventories has decreased while capital creation in the early stages, such as product development, is increased. See, so you get a two-way thing. You get a, a skewing, okay? You never find that in Keynes. So the structure of production is given more of a future orientation, which is consistent with the savings that made the restructuring possible. People are saving because they're planning on being able to buy more in the future. So note the increased growth rate here. See, so we're doing the same thing as before, only showing how it changes once there's an increase in saving. All right. Now this, this I think, is illuminating. We can track here, as tracked by both the PPF and the Hayekian triangle, consumption is seen to fall as the economy is adapting to a higher growth rate, okay? After which consumption rises more rapidly than before and eventually surplus, surpasses the old projected growth path. Look at it on the right side, down and then up. Look at it on the triangle side, down and then up. Two different views of the same thing. Let's plot it against time, consumption against time. You have a reduction in consumption followed by an increase uh, in consumption activity. And if you compare that to what the growth path would have been without the saving, uh, you can see that saving implies giving up some consumption in the near future, and that would be that area, uh, in order to enjoy more consumption in the immediate future and possibly far future, okay? And that would be that area. Now, stage-specific labor markets. Here, I'm just replacing our uh, chemical researcher and our retail manager with supply and demand curves. And that's supply and demand for their services. And so we can see that that shift then brings about changes in demand for labor, but in opposite directions as far as late stage and early stage. So we can watch that. Okay, watch the demand curves in those uh, lower diagrams. So you have a demand for late stage going down. Don't need to stock so much retail stuff but a demand in the research wing there going up uh, because at lower interest rates, it's more profitable to increase in those activities. The difference, the differential shifting of labor demand gives rise to a wage rate gradient. And I discovered this when I, when, when I made this diagram, I put in this gradient. It just shows that that gradient will persist until the economy is fully adjusted to the new saving rate. Uh, and that very term, wage rate gradient, plus a graph, is included in a footnote in the second edition of Hayek's Prices and Production. It's, I think it's a little cryptic, but once you, once you see what it is, then you can, you can pick it out. So look for a footnote in edition two of prices and production that has a graph in it and you'll see <laughs> what that gradient looks like. Okay, we're getting to the end of, of our first round here before we get into business cycles. So look what we've got going for us. We've got a loanable funds market, production possibilities frontier, we've got the triangle, and we've got the different labor markets. Now, so we can watch the whole thing at once, okay? I'm going to do it twice because you can't see everything at once, okay? So we're going to show an increase in saving. And it's like poetry in motion, in motion here. Everything is coordinated. Let me back up and do it again. Okay. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to skip past this because this is just Steve Hankey uh, 
saying that Hayek uh, was right. <laughs> and I'm going to skip this. I love this. I actually took that picture. Uh, and it's only Hayek saying that Hanky is right. <laughs> <laughs> and I put both of those in there to make the case that I'm right, all right? <laughs> so <laughs> we got there, okay? Now, credit expansion. See, I, I, hey, I've got 15 minutes left. I can do it. I think I can do it. Credit expansion. This is a whole new ball game. Increases in the money supply. How did that happen? Increases in the money supply enter the economy through credit markets. Well, they do. The central bank, uh-oh, liter literally lends money into existence. The new money masquerades as saving. It's not saving. It doesn't represent some work that somebody's done to produce goods that can be used for investment purposes. Okay? It's not saving. It's new money. That is, the supply of loanable funds shifts rightward, but without there being any increase in saving. Okay? So, to watch these opposing movements. This is a whole different ball game here. <laughs> Okay. Now, it kind of looks, like you squint your eyes, it just kind of looks like, okay, there's been an increase in saving. No, no. There's been an increase in savings. A, savings have been padded by newly created money. So it's, it's not S prime, it's S plus delta M. And now you can see what looks like two equilibrium, but it really can't be two equilibrium. So it's really, a, it's really a disequilibrium, all right? Because you're seeing that on the one hand, Saving is reduced. This probably says that responding to a lower interest rate, people actually save less and consume more. I mean, why save if all you get is one percent? Go ahead and consume. At the same time, uh, well, it says the result is not new sustainable equilibrium, but rather a disequilibrium that, for a time, is masked by the infusion of the loanable funds. So pumping new money through credit markets drives a wedge between saving and investment. Of course it does. Investors move down along their demand curves, taking advantage of the lower borrowing costs. We've got it. Shows the arrow down there. There go the the investors are borrowing that new money. Savers move down along their unshifted supply curves in response to the weakened incentive to save. All right? The discrepancy between saving and investment is papered over, literally, with newly created money, which itself represents no investable resources. Now, I think you can start to see, and probably can see the whole thing, that this really is just a corollary to our capital-based macroeconomics. Capital-based macroeconomics starts out showing how things can work out right, how markets can work, all right? And then this shows that a key instance, very relevant instance, of how things can go wrong if policymakers uh, disturb the market system. Okay, and so you have that you have that division or that difference between quantity supplied and quantity demanded, and of course that difference is precisely the amount of new money that was pumped into the economy, because that's that's the rightward shift of S to S plus delta M. Um, so much of Hayek's writing on money is aimed at shifting the focus away from the bedrock relationship between money and the general level of prices. See, that's the monetary stuff. MV equal PQ. And the whole focus is on the relationship between M and P. And Friedman pretty much nailed it here. <laughs> Inflation causes prices to rise. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Okay, but... MV equals PQ. What's Q? Q is a combination, added up, combination of consumption and investment. They're lumped together. Okay, so you don't, 
He doesn't look inside of Q to see what's going on. So Hayek shifted the shifted the focus toward the inner temporal discoordination that is caused by credit expansion. Okay, now we can trace this around. Favorable credit conditions spur investment activity. Spur, yeah. Which suggests a clockwise movement along the PPF in the direction of investment. All right, we can trace that up and see that investors are trying to pull the economy that way. All right. But income earners are actually saving less and hence consuming more, which suggests the counterclockwise movement along the PPF in the direction of consumption. And there that is. Okay. So now if you look at the axis, consumers are pushing upward parallel to the axis, vertical axis, and investors are pushing outward, rightward, uh, parallel to the investment. So the wedge between saving and investment translates into a tug of war between consumers and investors. It's not a regular tug of war, they're not pulling 180 degrees, they're pulling 90 degrees. <laughs> if they pull 90 degrees, uh, they simply get the economy off of its production possibilities frontier. Consumers pulling up and investors pulling right, okay? And the economy can go out in that direction, but it's not sustainable growth. The PPF is sustainable growth. If you go out in that direction, then you're in unsustainable growth. And let's, let's do the vector that resolves those two. In other words, the net effect is the is to push the economy outward beyond the frontier to what I call a virtual equilibrium. It's kind of wavy up there. They can't, you can't get there. You certainly can't stay there. But things will happen actually before you get there. Now, what happens with the structure of production? Well, it gets pulled in both directions against the middle. And this is something that the Austrians haven't paid enough attention to. And yet, it's hardcore in Mises. It's not at all hardcore in Hayek, all right? And, and let me show you. The low interest rate, consistent with a future orientation, stimulates investment activities in the early stages, yeah? But without sufficient resources being freed up elsewhere, many of these investment projects will never be completed. And so, we see the initiation of, pro of projects but turns out they can't be completed because the resources aren't there to complete them. Now, that part is recognized by Mises, by Hayek, by Rothbard, by all the Austrians. But some of them either ignore or even deny this other effect, which is critical, I think, to the theory. Compounding the intertemporal discoordination increased consumer demands, and who could doubt there's increased consumer demands because can't get much interest for their savings, they might as well spend, okay? That draws some resources toward the late stages, further reducing the prospects for completing a new capital structure. So we can, we can show that too. So the dynamics of boom and bust entail both overinvestment, as shown in the PPF diagram, and malinvestment, and, un and unsustainable lengthening of the Hayekian triangle, which shows up in the Hayekian triangle. Um, you, you could call it overinvestment in the early stages, but uh, the, the general term is malinvestment, meaning that overinvestment in the early stages. It doesn't mean overinvestment overall, <laughs> uh, but what gets left out is the metal. <laughs> okay, so you get overinvestment, which is shown in both of those uh, diagrams. These distortions are compounded by overconsumption as shown 
in both the PPF and the Hayekian triangle, like so. And uh, it's critical, I dug this out of Mises. It wasn't hard to dig out, it was sort of there, but people somehow overlooked this. Mises repeatedly used the phrase malinvestment and overconsumption. Hayek soft peddled even more than soft pedal, just ignored the notion of overconsumption and even has some passages that imply there isn't overconsumption. Uh, but there is. I think Mises was right, Hayek was wrong on that point. Okay. So the tug of war that pits consumers against investors pushes the economy beyond the PPF. The low interest rate favors investment and increasingly binding resource constraint keeps the economy from reaching that extra PPF point. So here I show, look at the PPF point. You get the, you get the economy rising up above it unsustainably and being skewed around one way or the other, skewed around historically normally in that direction uh, and eventually caving in, okay? The temporally conflicted structure production, dueling triangles, uh, that term was given to me by John Cochran of Metropolitan State in Colorado, eventually turns boom into bust and the economy goes into recession and possibly into deep depression. So watch that orange arrow. Some people have told me that orange and blue is not really the two colors I should be using. But it's Auburn University, you know. That's, that's where the orange and blue comes from. Okay. Now, look what we've got here. I mean, this, this is the vocabulary of booms and busts. You know, a wedge between saving and investment, a tug of war between consumers and investors, dueling triangles. <laughs> this is not going to turn out pretty, right? <laughs> That's the idea. Okay. And uh, I, I hesitate to do it this way. The, I'm going to talk about the triple P's. That sounds like a management course, you know. Uh, Patenting the supply of loanable funds with new money drives a wedge between saving and investment. Yeah, it does. Papering over the difference between saving and investment gives play to the tug of war between consumers and investors. And pitting early stage stages against late stages distorts the Hayekian triangle in both directions, the temporary discoordination eventually turning boom into bust. Okay, so watch the economy respond to credit expansion. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Can any of you d d uh, identify that guy? That's Joe the plumber in a, <laughs> in a election race several years ago. Okay, and that's it. I mean, the <laughs> Joe the plumber is the one that's getting screwed, isn't he? And the politicians that do the business, they get off the hook. Okay, it's quarter till. I better end there. Thank you much.